welcome, welcome Los Angeles Film School students, alumni, and friends of the Los Angeles Film School and Recording School. My name is Joe Byron, and I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at the school. And uh, we're really, really happy that you could join us. And I want you all to meet a person who's become a pretty good friend. He's a graduate of, of our school, uh, graduated back in 2008 in our Recording Arts program. Probably sat in this room back in... At some point, definitely sat in this room. Uh, but Jeff Barnes, who is the president of the legendary record plant, okay? The record plant here in Hollywood that's been famous since this is... 1968. <laughs> so, Jeff, before we talk about the record plant, which we really want to learn more about it, of course. Uh, I want to learn more about you first, okay? Tell me, go back to high school, okay? Okay. Uh, where did you where did you go to school? What were you like as a as a teenager? What were your aspirations? What 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 is it you wanted to do at that time? <laughs> uh, music, in short, I, you know, I think even to go back prior to that, I grew up playing piano. I started playing piano, uh, taking lessons at the age of four, and still play piano today. Uh, play all sorts of other keyed things as well. Um, but getting into high school, I a little before that had picked up trumpet and was doing marching band and got a drum line in high school. So I was really heavily focused on, on music and loved it. Didn't really know what I wanted to do though. I didn't, I don't think I had really taken the time to think through the different avenues that were possible uh, in the music industry. But I knew that I loved music, it was something I was passionate about and that was always the goal. And so, you know, as far as um, where I grew up, I grew up down in Orange County, so Southern California in Garden Grove. And so there was a relocation when I did eventually make my way up here to, to the LA Recording School at the time, and, but not too far, not as far as a lot of people. So you were into music, you know, by the way, I played trumpet in the marching band nice. too, not very well. It's a tough instrument to play. <laughs> Uh, but uh, how did you go from making music to, be, to being involved in the, the science and technology of recording music? So after high school, I had a couple kind of random jobs and was fortunate enough to be able to get into the NAMM show. And I think this was back when you still had to be a part of the merchandising side of the industry. You, you couldn't just buy a ticket. <laughs> right, 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 um, right. But I managed to get a ticket and I I'd been going for a number of years. And at that point, they used to give out all the different big magazines and you could pick up you know, all these copies for free. And I, I actually still have the copy. I picked up a copy of Mix Magazine. And crazy story, I didn't realize this until a decade later, but the cover of that Mix Magazine was Record Plant. And it was in that magazine that I found an ad for the LA Recording School. Wow. That Crazy really, story. That is really cool. That is really cool. So uh, the, at that point in time, the Recording School had moved from North Hollywood, right? Yeah, it was this building. So you had just come into 6690 here in this building, and uh, that was in 2007. Uh, so what was it like going from uh, Garden Grove yeah. to Hollywood, the big, the big scary um, town? It was definitely an adjustment. It was exciting in, in a lot of ways. And I think that in, in many ways, that was the first time that I really felt like, okay, this is, I could do this. You know, I, I had done a little bit of college stuff before that, uh, but nothing ever clicked like uh, getting in, involved in, in the technical side of music did. And, and I really looked at my background and understanding of music as a really great foundation but at the time I viewed engineering as uh, a more unique and, and um, maybe more focused entrance into the industry. Did it seem like it might be more viable too in terms of making a living? I think naively I thought it was easier, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I, I look back in retrospect and, and really understand how naive that was. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember back in those days, I think there was a, uh, you had to do uh, uh, an internship or something 
Did you ever do an internship when you were in the program? Yes, I did. Um, so one of the jobs I had at the time was working for a large church down in Orange County, and I actually interned in the audio department of the church. Um, I didn't even remember that. Um, but yeah, so I was able to get some of that kind of live sound background too in that moment, which to transition over to the recording studio side, it's always nice to see on resumes that somebody has live sound experience because you know they can set up things quickly. They are you know, able to uh, deal with signal flow and some of those kind of basic things, but they're things that are more important in a way, uh, you know, more time crunched in a live setting. Got it, got it, got it. Okay, so the big question is now, you've graduated with your certificate in yes. recording arts. Yes. And now you've got to make a living you got to pay your you pay your loans, mm -hmm. and you go to work. What was your first job coming out of school? So I, before I had even finished school, I sent out four resumes to different studios in town, uh, one of them being the record plant. And I believe I had interviewed and been hired before I actually even graduated. Uh, and to, again, look back in retrospect from today, I realize how much of, uh, you know, just, fortunate timing and uh, that was wow you know what i believe in miracles <laughs> i do believe in miracles because i have heard this story told by other people as well it's not just being in the right place at the right time which it is yeah but it's also being ready at that time to do 100 percent. <laughs> and you were ready so of these four how did you choose them how did you, uh, I, how did you research them I, I really just looked at the what I considered to be the top studios in Los Angeles mm -hmm. and w you know looked at which ones I felt like were going to be a good fit for me and which ones I appreciated you know the work that they did the most and those were the four that I sent. I couldn't even tell you what the other three are. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> it's been no disrespect to all great studios. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Hopefully we have grads at those other places sure. too. <clears throat> so what do you think in the interview or in your resume or whatever you presented to them got you the job? Uh, there's a few <clears throat> things. I think, again, having a good resume helps. Uh, I think at the same time, the way you present yourself is still really important. And so there was a small detail, it's actually really funny. So I was interviewed and fortunate for a long time to work under Rose Mancherney, who was the many decades long president of Record Plant. Legendary, she is amazing. Absolutely. And her husband legend too. And just a beautiful person. Yeah. Um, and Rose is, it was really, really, really great at what she did. And she, uh, she was one of the people that I interviewed with on that first day. And Rose pinpointed that on, I was wearing a, a collared shirt and on the sleeve of the shirt I'd had my initials monogrammed. I thought I was way more important than I was. Um, but she saw that and said, you have a, you, you pay attention to details. And well, I'm not, you know, <laughs> I don't recommend that everyone go spend a bunch of money getting all their shirts monogrammed. But um, I think paying attention to the details and, and really, even though it's the music industry, it's laid back, it's fun, uh, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a job and it, you know, we take things seriously and I think dressing like you would for any other job interview makes a big difference. So I think, you know, I think the resume helped. I think that, um, you know, having gone to a recording school that was respected is important, but I, I also think the, you know, how you interview, the way you sit down and, and hold yourself and how seriously you take that opportunity is equally important. I agree, and I want to come back to this subject later on whenever we're talking about uh, your movement through the company. What was your first job there? I started out as a runner, uh, the basic entry-level job, and that, you know, 13 years ago, and, and still today, it's cleaning bathrooms, picking up food for clients, picking up anything the clients want. Um, at, at Record Plant, we do all the cleaning and maintenance in-house, so it's it's a demanding job, and even though it is usually at the runner position no more than eight hours a day, the amount of attention to detail that it requires in those eight hours, it's exhausting. It's a tough job. Did you feel you were overqualified for a low-end position like that? <laughs> no, I honestly, um, I went in very humble. Um, I think I was, 
I wouldn't say starstruck by any means, but I think I was very conscientious of the caliber of artist, not only that Record Plant had built its name off of, but the artists that were working there when I started. Um, you know, legendary artists. And, and so I think very conscientious of that and honored to have the opportunity to even be, to be in the space. Um, and that's one of those things that I always, I don't think I ever took for granted was the, even though it's a difficult job and, and no one wants to clean bathrooms, uh, at the same time, it was, it's a legendary place. It, you know, it's, if you want to clean a bathroom, that's the one you want to clean. There you go. There <laughs> you go. See, <clears throat> you had the attitude. You had the good attitude. You find something that makes the bad parts of it okay. You know. Well, you, and if you if you look at it as part of your path in your career, and it's a stepping stone, um, it, it makes makes perfect sense. <laughs> so how long did you, were you a runner? I mean, when, when did you get your first oh, break in terms of doing- You're asking me the hard questions. Doing <laughs> something that was required just a little bit more, something that demanded your training or experience. So my, my journey is twists and turns a little bit. Um, I was working as a runner. I'd probably been there for about a year, year and a half when one of the clients asked me to start playing keys on his session that night and then moving forward and I was in shock I was you know I always was really conscientious to respect the boundary between you know my own personal music and the things that I would work on and our clients because they don't you know the clients don't go to a studio like that to be barraged with people asking them you know oh, listen to my music no they don't want that oh. um, and it, it came up very organically they were the ones who were pursuing saying like well tell me what you do like what are your interests and so I actually went to the studio manager at the time and I said, I'm not asking for permission. I'm, I'm asking for advice. I don't know what to do here. Um, you know, because the client basically had said, I either want you to play keys on my session tomorrow or I'm going to take my uh, session to another studio. And I was just like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> um, and so I did get the, the go ahead from the, the studio managers and you know, I actually pursued songwriting and production, tying back to, you know, the years that I've been playing, uh, playing keys. I uh, pursued that pretty hard for a couple years. And during that time, you know, obviously, on one hand, got a lot more kind of back into the mix of doing the, the technical side of creative stuff. Um, but I also took on a more day-to-day -day managerial role at the studio, kind of pulling myself out of the the path to progress towards assisting because I knew there were other people that were obviously wanting those spots and I didn't want to take anything away uh, from them and it also gave me the opportunity to have a little bit more consistent hours you know working kind of the day shift um, the reception position at the studio so that I could go and do all my sessions at night you know, having a day job in a studio is better than having a day job out of it, a studio. Yeah, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not a position that is available. That's right. But it's one of those that it kind of became available, and it, it worked out pretty well. And it worked out for Record Plan all right, too. So what was, the, what was your title at that point? Uh, so for a while, I was just the day phones person. I think over you know, the next couple months, progressed into officially having the head runner title which is basically, you know, managing all the runners. Uh, you do all the scheduling of the runners and just making sure that the studio is running well, really at that kind of ground floor level, making sure that everything gets done. Wow. And? And? And, and from that point, you know, I, I had the opportunity to um, be the interim booking manager and did that for a couple, uh, couple months. And then that evolved into just hey, do you want to be the studio manager now? And I did that for probably two years. And that's again where, you know, there's uh, Fabian Marashulo, big, big mix engineer, um, great guy, once told me that you should never turn down a job because it's not what you thought you'd be doing. And I think that's, it's brilliant. It's advice that I still hold dear today. And again, did I think that I was going to be at that point booking 
a recording studio? Well, no, but it was a great opportunity and it was progression, it was moving forward. And while it wasn't necessarily what I thought I would be doing, it was still a really great opportunity and I had to take it. Yeah, I remember I saw a press release that you had been made studio manager yeah. in the trades and, and uh, my friend Steve Miller, who was the program director mm -hmm. back when you were a student, he yeah. and I said, wow, Jeff's really moved up the ladder <laughs> here. He really, really deserves it. You know, he's really put a lot into it. And we oh, didn't even you. know the nuts and bolts of what you were doing. <laughs> But uh, Steve remembered the kind of student you were and said, you know, he's on really the right trajectory. And then uh, I got another press release later, but it was a lot later. What happened right after that? What happened after that? So the, the next opportunity to, you know, move up the ladder would have been into the vice president role. And that was really at a kind of pivotal moment for the company. Um, Rose, who we have been, you know, mentioned earlier, was stepping down after a very long career. And for a brief moment, myself and another uh, gentleman, Jason Carson, who'd been with the company for a long time, were co-VPs. And I still maintained all of the day-to-day -day booking um, and, and kind of operational management side of the studio. And then after a number of months, uh, Jason moved on to some other stuff as well. And so uh, I remained as kind of the, the lone captain uh, in the VP role and kind of stayed in that uh, vice president role for a number of years and brought on some additional kind of admin support and to help more on the booking side of the studio at that point. And, you know, really at that point, the hierarchy was, you know, the, really the owner and then myself running the full operation day to day. And, and then the, I think we had promoted somebody into the studio or, or hired someone into the studio manager role at that point. And it was during that point actually that the, the company was sold, changed hands. Um, and you know, it was a really interesting process to see. Um, and for myself, uh, it was after the new owners purchased the company and kind of everybody got their footing that I was ultimately promoted to president. So it's, there's kind of a nice consistent, you know, two or two or three years between each promotion and, um, you know, the actual job duties from vice president to president didn't really change all that much. <laughs> um, but you know, at the core, I, I run a, I run a business. <laughs> you know, you know what I love about that, uh, Jeff is that you stayed with, this organization through a lot of changes. Yeah. For 13 years, right? Yeah. From right out of recording school, uh, from like right out of seeing a mix magazine yeah. with the cover. Well, and again, it was a, I had worked at Record Plant for probably a decade before I even realized that that magazine that got me down this pathway had Record Plant on the cover. But what it, what it also tells me is that you, there's something about you that keeps what the record plan is going through these changes, and especially through an ownership change. Yeah. You know, owners, owners oftentimes like to start, you know, they'll bring in their brother-in-law, their kids or something to run organizations or, or other people that they know and they, they can trust, but they went with you. That says something about what you brought to the table for yeah. the organization. Well, you know, at the end of the day, the it's a very unique business and so it has its own unique set of challenges and, and considerations from an operational side but kind of on the outward facing side of the the business it's it's very very relational and you know one of the things that i always you know like to be mindful of it's it's easy to charge somebody's credit card anybody can charge a credit card but to know when not to charge the credit card is hard. That's the hard part. And that's why where a lot of, I felt that my value was retained and where the value that I added to the company was really important was that continuity through all of it, the relationships that, again, even as the, the head runner and the, the person answering the phone was starting to build those relationships with those labels and the, you know, the admin people and it's those relationships that, you know, good or bad, if a, a label calls you and they're in a last minute panic for a room, you know, it's 
those relationships, you know, like, okay, well, I trust you. If you're, you know, we're booking things, we can hammer out kind of the business end later. Let's get the artist in. Let's let them be creative and do what they do. And we have a good enough working relationship to do that. Um, at the same time, if, you know, a label is calling and asking for a favor because, you know, so there was tech downtime or something didn't go right or, you know, it's it's those relationships that all of that's built off of. And, and so it, you know, there's a lot that goes into it. Yeah, I love, I love what you're saying about relationships. And you threw another word in there that I love too, and that is trust. Yeah. Uh, them, people trusting that you're going to make good, that you're going to be respectful, that you're going to act as a professional, and the people that you choose to work with and the people that you choose to collaborate with, you know, you have, you know, there's trust that goes both ways. 100%. And it's, it's trust, it's, it's handling yourself and, you know, whatever your business is, whether it be the record plant or, you know, somebody who's an independent engineer, handling yourself ethically, legally, <laughs> of course. Um, you know, we've had clients who have double paid for sessions. You start talking about some of these bigger companies and those types of things can happen. And, you know, I've always maintained, like, you have to be transparent in that. You got to say, hey, you, you paid me twice. You know, you, I owe you a little money on this one. And it's those types of things that accumulate. And and at the end of the day, you have to be long-sighted in all of this. If you look at, oh, hey, I just got an extra $1,000. Well, that's great, if I guess, if, if that's what you want. But looking at it in the long term, what's the possible damage that it's going to do to you if you don't acknowledge that you got that? You know, you you have to handle yourself ethically and professionally and respectfully. So let's talk about the record plant. When it started, who recorded there, about the history, it's mystique. So the the quick history, it, a record plant was originally founded in New York in 1968 by Chris Stone and Gary Kelgren. And the very first album that they worked on was Jimi Hendrix Electric Ladyland. Just a lot of, you know, history in those moments and wow. You know, they saw the opportunity and the potential in that business, and they added another location in L.A. because the L.A. music scene was just starting to grow into its own at that point. And so that original L.A. location was built the following year in 1969. And then three years later, in 1972, they added a third location up in Sausalito, which is on the north side of the San Francisco Bay. And... You know, each one of those three, what we'll all call the original facilities, have such unique and amazing histories. Um, you know, Blondie, uh, Santana, you've got uh, Stevie Wonder. Uh, I mean, y y the list just goes on and on and on. And this is not a big studio. This is like a little kind of boutique. I mean, they're they're good, but they're, it's not like by any means a massive, massive operation like you, you see some of the studios today you know they're you know each one was a decent sized space um but you know really um really fortunate to be able to work with some some huge artists from the beginning and some impactful artists from the beginning and you know it was a couple years later in 1985 where the location that we currently reside in in los angeles was added and there'd been a fire a few years prior in the other LA location. And so we relocated on Sycamore, yeah. On Sycamore, and you were on? Third Street. Third Street. Kind of over by the Beverly Center. Right, right, right. And so we've been at the Sycamore location since 85. And at that point, the there were two rooms that were built. A lot of the record plant rooms at that point had been built by Tom Hidley, a legendary studio designer. Those front two rooms were built by him. And then the company actually went through a previous change of hands with owners in 1991. It uh, was kind of the, the defining mark. And there were two additional rooms added under that owner, Rick Stevens. And, you know, that gets us to the facility that we have today. And so out of all those different studios, the location that we're at now on Sycamore is the studio that we've been at the longest. And it is the only one that is still operated as the record plant. I, I love, they, they, I say that I have a, uh, a black belt in name dropping. Who, who are some of the people that are 
listeners or our watchers audience would would recognize that you've recorded there in the last most during your tenure there as studio manager gosh so when i started there was i mean we did a lot of black eyed peas for a minute we did mm -hmm. um pharrell we did a lot of the early kanye um it was just some historic albums um we did some britney spears christina aguilera um you know it it, it really, a lot of our business now is, is focused on top 40, uh, hip hop, R&B. Uh, more recently, we did Khalid's album, we did Ariana Grande's album. And, you know, it's, it's an honor to be able to host all those projects. Because at the core, the record plant truly operates kind of like a high tech hotel. Um, we don't have any creative involvement, you know, as far as like the songwriting or producing goes. Um, you know, we're creative in what we do, <laughs> but, um, you know, it's, we really, we're just a recording space for hire and, you know, we know our gear really well. We know, um, you know, the foundation of what we do being so much so emphasizing hospitality. And that's why we excel with those types of artists, it, you know, artists that are particular about what they want and, you know, want to do things right the first time when you're working at that level, you can't make mistakes. It needs to be right the first time. There can't be a, oops, we didn't record that, or oops, the you know microphone was backwards or something. Uh, it needs to be right every time. And if it's not, it's a big deal. So the facilities, the technology has to be there. It has to be perfect. It has to be maintained, it has to be serviced. The, the vibe, the feeling, the hospitality, the care, Mm -hmm. All of those things. All of it. <laughs> All of those things. Wow. And what do you think drives? I mean, who, who, what drives business to you? You know, I think there's a few things. I think a, a, a huge part of it is the artists that are coming through today looked at the backs of Kanye albums 10 years ago and said, gosh, I want to, I want to be just like Kanye. I want to be in that studio. And they see the name Record Plant. Um, or, you know, they look at Stevie Wonder or they look at, you know, ACDC, you know, pick the, it's, they see the names and they want to be in those same studios. And, um, I think that's a big part of it. I also think there's the brand and the name hold value in the industry. And I think at some point, you know, a lot of our clients will be become aware of the name if they didn't already know it. And... I think that's a lot of it. Uh, another big part, honestly, is just the good relationships that we have over, you know, more than 50 years of working with, with the labels. Uh, and, and, you know, you build up relationships and then when a label needs a studio, they call the studios they know. So how do you make a relationship with a label and what's, what's the payoff on that? Well, I, I mean, I was fortunate to inherit a bunch of relationships with labels. All right, all right. <laughs> um, you know, I, as far as giving somebody advice as to how to start out, you know, from the ground floor, that's, that's tough. You know, you got to, I think you have to put in the time to let your work speak for itself and, you know, try and network. Um, but at the end of the day, it's to maintain the relationship. Hey, again, it's, it's running your business well. It's, it's taking care of people and realizing that, you know, at every level, everybody kind of has their own set of concerns. So the artist is focused on trying to stay creative. So when, you know, when a record plant is interacting with artists, our whole focus is on just trying to keep them in the creative environment, trying to not let them, not have them pulled out of that mindset. Uh, you know, and for the producers and the A&Rs kind of in that next level up, like, okay, well, again, like they're, they want the artist to be happy. <laughs> Uh, and then they also have their own concerns about like making sure that things are technically right, making sure that any requirements that the label might have are right. And then, you know, you get up to the label and again, they, they have their own unique set of concerns. So, you know, it's while we really just have kind of like one client, you really have sub segments of clients that you have to cater to and make sure that they all get what they need. Wow. Good stuff. Good stuff. Uh, I love the fact that you're practically walking distance from us. You know, we <laughs> share this Hollywood being reborn and being yeah. reinvented. I know that just time. the area around here is amazing. 
the area around you is is developing too greatly <laughs> and what what's what's happening in your your side i mean on our on our specific like two block little section it's you know if you rewind back to the 80s from what i'm told it was you know it was an industrial section right and it was like a big concrete funnel there's a there, concrete right? factory yeah. that's still there yeah. somehow i think everybody looks at it and it's like how is that here still um but yeah you know it's a largely industrial section but it's been developing over the last few years and you know we're seeing we've got restaurants on our street uh you know nice restaurants uh, there's a lot of boutique kind of retail spaces and so I think there was an article that was released not too long ago by LA Magazine saying that kind of that two block specific area is the new cultural hub of Los Angeles. And you know, there's other um, large entertainment brands that have space on, on that in these two blocks. And so it's really kind of becoming a, a really special spot. And we're, have, we're lucky to be there. You're gonna have some special neighbors there, right? We are gonna have some special neighbors. Who are those special neighbors? Oh, I mean, you know, there's some that we probably shouldn't talk about okay. then there's other ones you know uh sirius is down the street and um yeah there's some good ones very very cool you know we're also really grateful that over the years you've hired and not only hired but also collaborated with yeah. many many other uh recording school and film school grads uh can you mention any of them you know, I think the two that come to mind the quickest because they're they're personal friends at, by this point are uh, Enrique Andrade and Daniel Zeidenstadt, both um, incredibly talented engineers. Both started out as runners at Record Plant, and gosh, I couldn't even tell you, you know, probably a, a decade ago, give or take. And both have gone on to engineer and produce great great albums yeah i mean we recognize both of them yeah i mean they're they're young they're fairly new but uh uh and was uh was inducted into our spotlight academy last year and daniel's being inducted this year they have uh, platinum and gold records y they deserve it <laughs> and they deserve it they've done some amazing work and they started as runners yeah and and both again i think if you take either of them and look at them at that entry level running job, hardworking, devoted to the job. And, and that through line goes all the way up to what they're doing today. And there's a reason that they're successful. And what they're doing today, I know that Daniel is a, he's an amazing uh, voice engineer. Yeah. And that's been special. I know he's done a work with Elton John and yeah. Lady Gaga and Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's, it's amazing. I think I have a photo with Daniel and Bruce Springsteen somewhere. <laughs> really? I think so. I don't remember. Maybe not. All right. Here's, here's one of my favorite stories that comes out of the record plant that has to do with our alumni. I think you know what it is. And that is Enrique telling me he played ping pong there with Prince. Oh, goodness. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Tell me about that. I mean, so one of the things that's special about Record Plant is we really, again, we try to focus on, on it being comfortable. And so we've got ping pong tables, we've got basketball hoops, we've got billiards tables, a couple of them. <laughs> um, and we just try to help people relax so that, you know, if you come in and you're having a stressful day, you can kind of stop thinking about that, relax, have some fun, and then focus on what you need to focus on and be creative. And so, you know, the... From my experience and from the rumors, Prince was a avid ping pong player and good at it. And so, you know. Well, Prince is going to be good at whatever he wants to do, Prince. right? Yeah, he's Prince. <laughs> he's a Prince. Um, and so he would come in and, and regardless of, you know, the day of the week who was there, he was always playing ping pong. Um, you know, the, a lot of the clients had moments like that. There was another artist, uh, Most Deaf, who, if he was in the building, you would walk past our game room and he would be playing Miss Pac-Man, without a doubt. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, with Prince and Enrique, Enrique was assisting on the session at the time. And, you know, so he was clearly the, the ping pong adversary of choice for Prince. And I remember Enrique saying, I, I think he, he definitely had to kind of like throttle how aggressively he was trying to beat Prince because you don't want to disrespect <laughs> Prince, obviously. <laughs> no, no, but, no, no, no. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, uh, I, I want to say Enrique won 
at least a game or two. I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not positive. You'd have to ask him on that. But it happened. I I, I could verify that it happened. Oh, I know that much. Any other stories or anecdotes? Oh goodness. You know, there's a lot that we. <laughs> It's a lot we can't talk about. Well, let, let me change the subject a bit because we're now just beginning. We're not wearing masks right now, yeah. uh, which is really, you know, an amazing how amazing we've we've crazy crazy year we've been Incredible. through. What's been that? What's that been like for you as the chief executive president of the? Yeah, I, you know, as the uh, running the company as the president, it's been. Uh, it's been challenging, like anything. I think, you know, especially in the beginning phase of the pandemic, w many of us didn't know what this really was, what to expect. And, um, you know, I think there at, at n a number of different phases throughout the last year and a half, there have been unique and evolving challenges. And so... There's, to an extent, been a need to reinvent at times while also still staying true to what we do. Um, there were a number of months where we were closed um, and we wanted to be sure that we were safe and that our, our staff and our clients were safe. And, you know, when we did reopen, we had implemented a ton of new safety measures and protocols like everybody else. And, you know, at the end of the day, you, you had to move forward, you know, there's, there's real expenses in, in running a business like that. And um, so we just, you know, we have to do what we can to try and keep the business going and moving forward. And there was certainly the demand from the clients by that point to, to get back in. And so, you know, with, with being closed for a few months, there was definitely kind of a, a ramp up, but I think that was good for everybody. It allowed us to kind of get our sea legs, you know, situated with some of these new protocols and sterilization you know practices and you know it's it's been a, a a kind of a learning experience and a give and take you know to go to our clients historically we didn't we didn't have capacity limits we didn't have a lot of limits on what you could do it you know i think there's a, a logical level where it's like i think you have too many people here <laughs> but um you know starting to implement some of those things um, it, you know, was challenging itself, but also proved over time more challenging where, you know, we have clients that are coming from all over the country, all over the world. I don't think we've had anybody international lately, but, um, you know, when you have a client that's coming from a different part of the country that has a different set of guidelines and rules, you know, it, you have to be very careful in how you approach them and say, Hey, these are the rules here. I understand why, you know, it's can be, you know, uncomfortable or what or whatever, but you know, it's our job is to try and communicate to the client like, okay, well, here's the rules that that we have to abide by. Um, and so that's been a challenge to be honest, but at the same time, like I said, the demand is there and the studio has been incredibly busy. It's arguably the busiest it's been in a couple of years. That's that's so great. You know, uh a person who comes from, you know, being a musician, a trumpet player, a drummer, uh, and having, you know, those creative, and then picking up the baton of management and organization, and then to hit something like the pandemic, where now you're getting thrown probably as far as you could possibly be thrown from that marching band and that <laughs> drum circle, you know, that drum line, where you, I'm sure you have to deal with things like security and equipment maintenance and I don't know, maybe termites or mice or no, who yeah, knows what yeah. you have to I mean, when there's an empty building. When, when you are close for that, I mean, when it started, we thought we were going to be closed for two weeks and even that felt absurd. It felt crazy. Um, I mean, it felt appropriate given the circumstances, but it um, it was hard to wrap your head around, I think. And a lot of it just came to taking a step back and saying, like, okay, what do we need to do? Well, we need to make sure, you know, we need to address the equipment. We need to address the larger facility. We need to address security and some of those things. And so finding appropriate solutions to all of those uh, as the issues arose. And, and 
I think throughout the pandemic that really, you know, there's, there's so much of our business and, you know, life in general that you can plan for and be proactive and you should. And then there are moments like that where you, your only option is to react and you have to, you know, react as well as you can. Wow, I'm I'm really really impressed, and you know, I I I hope that I'm not saying condescending, but I'm really proud. <laughs> I'm really really proud of of you and how you've kept oh, this this thank institution you. going, and how connected with you, and how generous you are to give some of your time now. Uh, two, two last things, and then we can uh, we'll let you get back to work. <laughs> uh, one is I want what's what's do you think's in the future for the record plant now? You have any anything coming up that's exciting? Any, any expansions? Any you know, we still changes? great music. I think is always the you know what we aspire to in the future. Um, and there, there's always you know uh, I think as with any industry, but especially in the music industry, the cutting edge technology is always evolving. And so you know, making those investments and continuing to push the brand forward. And you know, it's um, making sure that we meet our clients where they need to be met. And so that, you know, evolves. And, and I think expectations and desires more so focused on the hospitality side of the business evolve over time. You know, if you rewind to when I started, we used to do, we would, every meal that would get picked up would get brought in and we had, you know, gloves and utensils and it would get removed from the restaurant's packaging and put on to an actual, like a nice dinner plate with a linen napkin and a silver platter, and it would get taken in like that. So it, it looked like it would be at the restaurant. Um, even before COVID, that was something that was starting to become less requested or uh, by the clients. And we had more clients saying, you know, you could just bring it in in the bag, and that was their preference. And so, you know, that's one of those things that we need to respond to. And Again, as the expectations and desires of our clients evolve, we have to respond to that in, in stride. I love it. I love it. I love the, I love the, the gentil kind of, you know, the customer is first. Respect the customer, be. take care of the customer. And from that, you get the trust and the loyalty from the customer. And, uh, you know, something that we oftentimes don't think about in terms yeah. of some of these people like, Prince <laughs> but when you look at when you look at artists like that, everywhere they go in their entire life, they're treated like that. Why would it be any different in the studio? It yeah. shouldn't. It can't. So the last thing I would like is for you to give some advice to our current students, or maybe our future current yeah. students, and our and our alums in terms of uh, if they're interested in. Working in a studio, either in an entry level, I mean, obviously an entry level position, but also in terms of maybe long term plans in it, or just a way to establish those relationships and to build the trust in the community of the entertainment industry. What advice can you give everyone? Yeah. I mean, I've already given a lot of advice, but let's see if we can wrap it up. I mean, again, I, I, I have to go back to, to our good friend Fabian uh, and his advice of never, never say no to a job because it's not what you thought you would be doing. I think that's brilliant advice, especially in today's day and age where everything's evolving so quickly. Um, but beyond that, I think, again, um, to try and have the, <laughs> I'm going to contradict myself. And so to try and have that long view of where do I want to go and what are the logical steps that will get me there. And, you know, for some people, if you want to get into engineering, working at a studio like Record Plant makes a lot of sense. Um, at the same time, if you just want to be a producer, Record Plant might not make much sense for you. <laughs> um, so I think the more you can have a defined idea of what you're aspiring towards, the better you're going to be able to to kind of navigate you know there's a lot of unknowns out there and it, you know a lot of choices that have to be made as far as what makes sense what doesn't and you know where to apply for a job and where not to um and i think the other thing is just to to keep working and stick at it at the end of the day i i truly believe uh, and i think my own story is a testament to the fact that there is a place in you know the entertainment industry for anybody that wants to be in it and 
if you carry yourself respectfully and work hard and stick at it, you'll find that spot. It might not be where you thought you were, but you know, you'll find it. Amen. Really, really good words. What are you doing for fun? Fun. Uh, I'm I'm a dad. I'm a new dad, so that's uh, I mean. You know, kind of that's the, the ultimate joy. That's super fun. Yeah. That's super fun. Other than that, trying to sleep right now. <laughs> so once again, Jeff, thank you so much oh, for my your pleasure. time. Uh, thank you so much for, you know, sharing so much of what you've done. And like I said, we are really, really proud of you. Uh, and I think, I hope everyone out there can see that being a nice guy, being a person <laughs> who's patient, being a person who's responsible, you know, these are all such great qualities to have that can lead to the places that who would have thought? Who would have thought? Not me. Thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you.